As we continue our sermon series on the book of Colossians, where we will explore what it means to live a Christ-centered life, our focus is on the supremacy of Jesus Christ in all aspects of our lives. As we study the book of Colossians, we will gain a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and how we can live our lives in a way that honors Him. Our theme is Jesus, first in everything and we will examine how Jesus is first in our relationship with the Father, in His creation, in the unseen world, in inheriting all things, in sustaining all things, in the church, in the resurrection, and in everything, period. There you go. Well, we are in... Uh book of Colossians, and we're in the first chapter, and boy, this is one of those messages that I want to, of course, every message ought to be this in some form or fashion, but I really want to brag on Jesus. Uh, the title of the message today is, see up on the screen, Jesus first, Jesus first in everything. Uh, we could call it Christ above all, and uh, it's found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, and I'm going to read down through verse 18. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, down through verse 18. He, of course, this is speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence, all right, that he may be first. And that's why we're calling it Jesus first. So let's pray. God, as we go to your word today, we're so grateful for this passage of scripture today that, that gives glory and honor to you. Lord, uh, thank you for giving us uh, life, creating us. Lord, there's so many times for all of us that we walked in darkness. We did not acknowledge our Creator. I thank you for that time when you opened our eyes in ears of understanding. And you helped us to realize that we just didn't come. The stork didn't bring us. Lord, you created us. And you give us life, you sustain us, and Lord, you want us to have the abundant life. You want us to know you. You want us to receive you and have your life come and live through us. So that when others look, to, look at us, they see you. Oh Lord, help that be true. And help us today to magnify and glorify you through these verses of Scripture that do such a wonderful job of that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, this has been, you know, we just went through this wonderful prayer the last couple of weeks in Colossians. And now he just, Paul just brings us here, as it's been described, one of the most wonderful pictures in all the Bible of Jesus, to help us Christians to really appreciate Him, and to think that He is writing this in a in a deep, dark, dank prison cell. The Holy Spirit is speaking to Him, and He's writing this, and giving us this wonderful description of who Jesus is, and uh, why is He in? Why is Paul in jail? Well. Because he keeps telling everybody how wonderful Jesus is, all right? And it's amazing that people don't want to hear that often. Uh, and it cost him because of that. It cost him his freedom, obviously. It's, it's cost him his reputation. It's cost him his income and his health and his welfare. And he's been beaten and he's went through shipwrecks. And he's been left for dead. Stone, literally, almost uh, dead and resurrected. And uh, he suffered a lot because he loved Jesus and because he preached Jesus and Jesus crucified. Now, for Paul, as with so many, uh, the ultimate rewards will come later. 
And that's why he's, he's living his life out and giving up his life in order to glorify Christ as we all should do. And so we're looking this morning at this idea of Jesus first in everything. And I want you to see up here on the screen that portion of that last verse, if you'll bring that up. And I've got three translations I want to put up here on the screen. And the first one is the one I read to you just a few minutes ago from the New King James. And it says that in all things he may have preeminence. Young's literal translation puts it this way, that he might become all things himself first. And then the Amplified Bible says, in every respect, they might occupy the chief place. All right? So that word preeminence means to have first place. And when I was thinking of someone having first place beyond God and beyond Jesus, I thought about the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't know why. But they're the world champions, and they're in first place. And, and they can say, I am chief, okay? And Jesus, he's chief. He's chief. I'm chief. I'm Lord. And uh, Jesus just doesn't want a place in our life. He doesn't just want pr uh, prominence in our life. He wants to be preeminent. He wants us to, wants to be first. And I want to share with you, as time permits, about eight of these, and break these verses down, and all of them begin the same way. Jesus is first in relationship to the Father. Notice back in verse 15 again where we started to read. He is the image of of the invisible God, the image of the uninvisible God. Here is a definition of Jesus in his relationship to God. And to begin with, it says we understand that I don't know about you guys. Now, I've heard some crazy people do some talking who have said they saw God. All right, and they weren't talking about Jesus. But I think they were, you know, on one of those funny pill trips, okay? Because the Bible tells us that God, as far as God the Father, is invisible. In fact, I want to show you some verses up here on the screen that relate to that. John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. In Exodus 33, 20, no man can see me and live, is what God uh, said. And then 1 John 4, 12, no one has seen God at any time, all right? Because obviously God cannot be seen because uh, I want you to see up here in John, Jesus told us matter-of-factly that God is a spirit, all right? You can't see a spirit, all right? It's invisible, Notice what Jesus said. Handle me and see me, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. All right. Not only is Jesus emphasizing, again, the spiritual aspect of God, but he's emphasizing the fact that he took on flesh and bone. All right. What I'm getting at is going back to John chapter 1 and verse 18. And I love the way the NIV explains or translates this verse. It says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. All right. So what I'm getting at is Jesus has made the invisible God visible. Jesus has made the unknowable God knowable. He is the one that's provided that for us. He is the image of, as Paul says, the invisible God. Jesus is that image of him. All right? Now, that Greek word that's used there for image is a word that we use now in our day and age. It's called icon. An icon. All right, I want to show you some icons up here on the screen. You know, you, you look at some of these, and there's Google, and there's Apple, and there's Facebook, and there's Amazon, and Microsoft, all those, all those things. If you have on your computer screen, and I know those of you who have computers or have, you know, laptops or whatever, you have little icons on there. And that little icon, you press a Amazon, you can go to Amazon site, you press, you know, Google, you can go to Google site, and so on and so forth. Well, you press Google. Jesus, all right, and you go to God's side. You go to being able to see God and to be able to know God. If we didn't have Jesus, then we would be obviously very limited because you can't see a spirit. So 
I think about an old story that's been told many times, and I know I, I would I venture to guess that most all of you heard this, but it's so applicable here, I've got to share it with you again, of a preschool teacher, all right, that uh, uh, was told everyone to draw a picture of what was important to them, all right. And one little boy in the back, call him Little Johnny, was uh, laboring over his drawing and really getting with it. And everyone was finished, but Johnny, you know, kept, kept drawing. And finally the teacher asked him, she said, what are you drawing? And, she, and the little boy said, well, I'm drawing God. And she said, well, Johnny, no one knows what God looks like. And he said, they will when I get done, all right? <laughs> now, that's Jesus, right? That's Jesus, We've got a picture of God because we've got a picture of Jesus in our mind, all right? The Lord Jesus Christ is what God looks like. What the Lord Jesus Christ did is what God wants us to do. How the Lord Jesus lived is how he wants us to live. That's why he said, those that have seen me have seen the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So the unknown God becomes known through Jesus. There is a, so again, we see in relationship that fact that Jesus in relationship to the Father. Then the second point I want to bring up this morning is Jesus is first in relationship to his creation. Notice it says the, he is the firstborn over all creation. Now, you might not be aware of that, but that little phrase, firstborn of all creation, created a storm of controversy in the history of the church. All right. In fact, about 300 years after Jesus had ascended into heaven, they, of course, they began to have uh, gatherings during the time of Christ, uh, just right after the time of Christ that you read about in Acts chapter 15. But they would keep having meetings and they would have people come from various places and they would talk about the doctrine of the Bible because the Bible was new and the books of the Bible were new. And who do we include this by book or do we leave that book out? You know, there are more books out that were out there than what we have, but they, of course, determine through the Holy Spirit and through, you know, God's intervention what should be placed in there and what should be left out, what was Scripture, what was, uh, uh, you know, applicable, and what was not. Now, in relationship to that, there was a council that met in 325 A.D. It was the Nicene Council. And somebody come up with the idea. In fact, his name, he had a name. It was Eris, A-R-I-U-S, came up with the idea from that phrase right there. Well, the fact is, is that Jesus was a, cre a created being instead of the creator because it says he was the firstborn. So in other words, Arius' thought was he create, God, Jesus was created and God created, the, God the Father created him first, all right? And so that meant, in essence, that there was a time when Jesus was not. So he was not the creator, but part of the creation. He was the firstborn of creation. And of course, that is an attack that's still going on today. All right. People will come to your door. They have Watchtower and Awake magazines, and they believe that. They believe that Jesus is not God Almighty. He's a little God, G, all right. He's the firstborn of creation, all right? And we could go into other uh, uh, groups and cults and so on and so forth that believe in that. And what it is, is it's an attack that's still going on today on two basic areas that are the false systems in this world. And they deny two things. Basically, they deny the deity of Christ, that he was not God in the flesh. And they deny the sufficiency of Christ, that Jesus alone can save you. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. They attack those two things, all right? They want to tell you, well, you got to go out here and work for your salvation. That's why they go door to door and so on and so forth and hand out magazines. And that's why many other groups do that too. But that word firstborn means two things, two distinct meanings. First, it means in relationship to birth order, all right? You know, you think of a family. You know, you got big brother and little brother, and big brother says, hey, I get the top bunk. Little brother, you get the bottom bunk, okay? But we realize that there's more to it than that. It also means rank. Rank. And that's what it's speaking of here. You know, sometimes you think of we have like, 
with each president we have, we have a first lady, they call her, okay, first in rank. Well, here the word firstborn is speaking of rank. He's above all. He's above all. He was not created. In fact, the ancient rabbi said about God himself that he was the firstborn of the world. We realize there was a time when there were no human beings and all there was was the Holy Trinity. All right. And the Holy Trinity, we read about them in the book of Genesis as they said, let us make man in our image. Let us. All right. Not singular, but plural. All right. And of, of course, the uh, wonderful doctrine of that, that you don't want to deny. All right. So what Paul is meaning is that Jesus is first and he literally explains it with seven words in the next verse. He tells us what he means there. He says, for by him, all things were created. So he wasn't created himself. He created everything. And John says the thing, same thing in John chapter 1. Without him was not anything made that was made. So here in Paul with seven words there. All, for by him all things were created. And then of course he goes on and begins this trustee. Where he talks about you know in essence. What we're going to look at. Is without him was not anything made that was made. Alright. Who created everything? Well, not some subpar God, not some created being. No, Jesus, the creator, created all things. And by him, all things were created through him, as we'll get to, and for him. All right? So it's all about him. And the mind can run in a thousand wonderful directions when you stop and think about the crucifixion itself. It was Jesus who created Golgotha. It was Jesus who created created the lumber that was used to build the cross that he was crucified on. It was Jesus who ultimately, as Mike talking about, you know, where does bread go back to? Well, it goes back ultimately if you keep going back with it or any food that we eat, it goes back to God. It goes back to God planting the seed, creating the seed, and so on and so forth. So you think about Jesus. He created even those things. Even those thorns that pierced his brow. Even the nails that they drove into his hands. God made everything. Think about, we look at the world today and he created the color. He created the hue. He created, created all the different uh, shapes and sizes and things in the universe. God made all that. Jesus made that. He made the heavens. He made the planets. He made the stars. He made the sun. He made the moon. All of those things. And it never came into existence until he commanded it. And what did he simply say? He spoke and it was done. He just said it. You know, the way he won, one of these days he's going to destroy the Antichrist uh, at that great army, battle of Armageddon. He's just going to speak and that'll be the end of the war, all right? So we see here about Jesus. And then Paul goes on to talk about not just the visible things, but he talks about the invisible things. And the third thing I want to point out to you this morning is the unseen world. He goes on to say not only visible right before that invisible, he says the invisible. And he begins with where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. You know, that verse always reminds me of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. You know, it talks about those things. It says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places, and so on and so forth. Now, I think about the spiritual world. You know, Jesus didn't create the devil, but he made Lucifer. Lucifer, the morning star. Lucifer, the great, apparently, archangel who had a specific place. And what did he do? He fell from heaven. God made all the angels. He, those that fell and joined Lucifer. God, Jesus, made all of them. And you think about that invisible world. I wanted, I wanted uh, sent uh, uh, Aaron some pictures. I was Google, talking about Googling something. Here was a seraphim drawing and it's interesting the seraphim is described in Isaiah chapter 6 as having six wings two wings that covered their faces two that covered their feet and two that were flying all right look at that creature now of course any drawing any artist rendering can't do it justice but think about we're going to see that someday 
And remember in Isaiah chapter 6, that's the very throne room of God. And that's where it's ho- where those creatures are saying, holy, 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 all right, is the Lord God Almighty as we sing that great song. And then I thought about another creature that he created, the cherubim, all right? And think about, I think about that, uh, you know, where they are placed, you know, we have that idea of them on the mercy seat, all right? uh, how they are described, for instance, in Ezekiel chapter 10, as having, now listen to this, as having a head that has four faces. I don't know literally that's the case. I'm I'm assuming. In addition to having four wings with what looks like human hands under their wings. All right, they got the wings here, and then they got the hands under the wing. I don't know. All right, but these creatures realize God, everything God created didn't have two eyes, two ears, two hands, two arms, two legs, so on and so forth, two feet, two hands. So think about here, these things that God created in the unseen world that Jesus made, that Jesus has authority over, that Jesus has power over. Fourth thing I want to mention as I'm, as I want to move, I have to move along quickly. Jesus first in relationship to inheriting all things. He goes on to say, Paul says, all things were created through him and for him so Paul says Jesus when it comes to Jesus I mean it's all about him we're here how did we get here how did you get where you are how did you get born through Jesus through him why are you here why do you exist and here's the thing that so many miss For him. You were created what? For him. For him. We weren't made for ourselves. So many people are going to live a selfish life. And even some of them in the religious circle are going to live a self-righteous life. And they're going to miss out on the very fact that you're not here for yourself. You're here for him. You were created for him. And as we see, he he is the heir, heir of salvation. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8, I want you to see up here. Verse 8, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That is the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Which in essence he's saying, I'm the A to Z and everything in between. And he goes on to say, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. Everything exists through him and for him, all right? He is the bookends of life, all right? He's the beginning of it. He's the ending of it. He started it. He will finish it. Now, speaking of Christ... And being the heir of all things. I want you to see up here on the screen a couple of verses I want to share with you. And these are wonderful when you stop to think about it. He's the heir of all things. And guess what? If you're a Christian here today, you're in his, you're in his last will and testament. In fact, we're going to celebrate that in a few minutes. All right? He's left you something. Not just one thing. He's left you everything. Notice up here on the screen, Romans chapter 8, verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. We are the children of God. Notice. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. And notice this. Joint heirs with Christ. We know what that language means. I mean, if you had, when your mom and dad passed away or one of them passed away or whatever the situation, and maybe you became an heir and they had other children, you were joint heirs together. You all inherited what they left. And notice Colossians 3 and verse 24, which we haven't even got to yet, saying, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thought to think of. We're children of his, so we're going, to re- we're going to inherit everything that Christ does. And guess what that is? That is everything. Hallelujah. Everything. Fifth thing I want to show you this morning. Jesus first in relationship <coughs> to sustaining all things. Sustaining all things. Notice it says, and he is before all things, and notice, and in him 
all things consist. All things consist. Now, here's another statement by Paul of calling Jesus the creator and saying everything that exists exists because of him. And he's eternal. Now, think about this. If I were to ask you what you were doing last year at this time, I'm sure a lot of you could remember where you were. I know I sure would. I was recovering from open heart surgery. That would be easy for me, all right? I go back another couple of years, it gets a little harder. But what about if I ask you what you were doing a thousand years ago? Tell you what you were doing. Nothing. Because you weren't here. Do you ever stop and think about, and I'm being serious here. Serious as a heart attack. Of going back and realizing there was a time you weren't around. And then you read in the history books of these people that have come and gone. And to think that, you know, I think sometimes in our little world begin to think almost, think that we've always been here. And we're always going to be here. You know? And I know children, they don't need to be dwelling on death and all of those things. But stop and think about that. Now, when you think about Jesus... What were you doing a thousand years ago, Jesus? Well, I was right here, all right? Right here running things, okay? His name is Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's been around forever, all right? There was never a time when he wasn't. He's eternal. But he says there, in him all things consist. Interesting term there. Here's another question. How do things run how is it that things are consistent? You know, I've, I've reached another plateau this past month. This month, I took another trip around the sun, all right? I'm another year older. Praise God, all right? Another year older. How does that sun keep on shining? How does the world keep on turning? How is it how so wonderful how it's placed where it is? And if you read some of those things, it's wonderful to think about how that the planet that we have is exactly the right distance from the sun and, and the moon and all of those things. It, uh, it consists because of him. He is the glue. He's the duct tape of the universe. Jesus is. All right. Now, here's something that's crazy. We have these silly people, the tree huggers. All right. They think that they're responsible for sustaining things. They think, oh, I'm so smart that I'm the one that's got to keep it together. I want to share with you a speech that was given by John Kerry, who formerly ran for president of the United States. And he told a group of attendees that this year at the World Economic Forum in Davos, direct quote in Switzerland, when you stop and think about it, it's pretty extraordinary that we select Groups of human beings because of what? Now, notice some of the terminology he used. Whatever touched us at some point in our lives and are able to sit in a room and come together and actually talking about saving the planet. Oh, thank you for John Kerry. Thank you for those people. We, wouldn't, we couldn't keep going without them. And he goes on to say, it's so almost extraterrestrial. To think about saving the planet. If you say that to most people, most people, they think you're just crazy. A crazy tree-hugging and lefty liberal, you know, do good or whatever. And I'm one of them that's in that group. Amen? All right? Okay? Now, you think about that. That's crazy. That's crazy. I want to show you two verses up here on the screen from uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and two translations of it. If you want to claim credit, claim it for God. The one who boasts must boast in the Lord. You know, don't boast in yourself. You know, there's a theory. It's all it is. Deism. Deism is a theory that believes in the existence of a supreme being and in a creator who does not intervene in the universe. Now, if you go back and check the history books, you'll find out that there were people of our founding fathers like the Jeffersons and the Franklins who believe, who were deists, all right? And what the deists basically believe in 
is that God created the world, and like the planet Earth, kind of like a top, he spun it, and then he walked away and left it. Left it on its own. In other words, he doesn't intervene. So that's why so many of them did not believe in the supernatural or believe in miracles, because God's not going to intervene. And I tell you, one key reason many fell for this, believed in it, because it explained why bad things happen in the world. Because, see, if bad things happen to people, it's not God's fault because he's not involved with the world. He, did, he created it, and he left it to us. So if we mess it up, it's, it's, it's on us. It's not on him. So I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ not only creates, but he sustains. He is involved in our universe. He holds everything together. In fact, to tell the climate change and climate control people, one of these days, he's going to destroy this earth. You know that? It's going to burn up. All right? You know, the, the Bible says that, of course, with a universal flood, that it was destroyed once by water and all the inhabitants that separate people. And one of these days, he's going to destroy this planet in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 by, you know, you talk about a big bang and you talk about an explosion. It says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Heat. You talk about heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Be burned up. Completely destroyed. So let the little green men believe in all that they want, as I call them. But I want to tell you what. Yeah, we need to take care of the earth. We need to take care of the sky. We need to take care of pollution. We need to take care of the water and so on and so forth. But we're not going to save it. All right, we're not going to save it. Now, there was a man by the name of Arthur Fry, all right, I want to tell you about. Arthur Fry was a chemist for the 3M Corporation. And you know, we have a 3M up at, as far as I know, a plant up at Nevada, Missouri. And Arthur Fry attended a, a seminar. All right. And in the seminar, there was a 3M scientist there by the name of Spencer Silver who had invented this unique adhesive that he developed in 1969. And what was unique about it was that it would cling to objects, all right, but it was weak enough that you could remove it. So it was a temporary stick. So Mr. Fry went to that meeting, and I, I know this is hard to believe, but he was in the choir at his church, and the pastor was preaching as he would say, uh, it was kind of a boring sermon. Now, I know you've never heard any boring sermons, especially here, right? So he, he was sitting there, and he had a choir. He had his hymnal, and he was there, and he, had that, and he was putting papers in there, you know, little markers to mark where the choir was going to sing their songs, all right? So he would have it. But then he experienced this. You would open up that book, and what would happen? Well, they would fall out, all right? brainstorm light bulb came on what about about this man that i heard talk about this adhesive if i would take that and we could apply it to you know like my little bookmarkers and use that voila in 1980 the first stick it notes came out all right and of course big bucks followed with the three in company and with this man himself. So you think about it, all right? Even a boring sermon can maybe prompt you to think about something, you know, that might get your mind and you'll, make, you'll become the next millionaire. But I say, I'll stay, I'll, uh, share all that with you th this morning because there is an adhesive, all right? And it's a temporary bond and his name is Jesus. He's the super glue of the universe. And without him, everything falls apart. And that's why we need to stick tightly to Jesus. Because I want to tell you what, as we had couples come this morning who are in their marriage relationship, what keeps marriages stuck together? But the super glue of Jesus Christ. He is the one that uh, is the super glue for marriages and relationships and family life and, and churches. Which brings me to a sixth thing. And I'm, 
I'm going to, I'm already in big trouble uh, time-wise. Notice Jesus is first in relationship to the church. Notice it says that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. Now, think about this. We're going to celebrate that we're a body. All right? We're going to pass out bread, and we're going to, that represents his body. We're going to pass out these little cups that represent his blood. And what is a body made of? All right. It's made out of those two elements. And we're celebrating that. But we're one. We're all of those things, but we're one. We're members of his body. All right. And him being the head means he's the boss. He's the chief, as I talked about. He's first place. He's command central. He's who we listen to. He's who directs us. When Ronald Reagan was president... The man that he appointed as Surgeon General was a man by the name of C. Everett Koop. And C. Everett Koop had the distinction that he was the first man to separate Siamese twins, all right? And what's the problem with Siamese twins? Twins, obviously, two heads, all right? And think about it, all right? A body without a head is dead, and, and a body with two heads is a freak, a freak of nature, all right? We don't need two heads, we don't, some churches get in big trouble when they begin to think they're the head or somebody in that group or some deacons or elders or pastor begins to think he's the head of the church and what he says is what goes and he doesn't consult the head. He doesn't go by that and that's obviously not the way the body works. You know, like right now, my body, my head is saying to the body, I could say, take a drink. Where is command central? The head, right? The head, all right? We always need to remember who is the head. I remember one particular pastor that uh, I knew that went to a church that called him in view of a call to pastor that church. And the little, little pastor selection committee met with him. And they had one problem with him after meeting with him. He answered literally every question they had with the Bible, he would quote scripture to them. And they said their complaint was too much Bible. Can you believe that? Too much Bible. We don't, we don't think we want this guy. So you think about that. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if every member would be sensitive to the head the way our body is? And wouldn't it be wonderful if we were in subjection to the head? And I'm talking about Jesus. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we consulted the head before we made any major decisions? And here's a little something that I, here is a, you've heard of the King James Version. Here's King Edward's version here of myself. I want you to see up here on the screen. Here's, here's basically, I think, the solution to any issue in the church between two people is the Jesus in me would come together with the Jesus in you to trust and obey the mind of Christ, all right, contained in the scriptures. Why can't that happen? And if it doesn't happen, that's why we have any problems, which brings me to a seventh thing I want to share with you quickly. He's first in relationship to the resurrection. Notice it says, the firstborn from the dead. There's that term again. And again, as we talked about earlier, it's rank. He's, he's not the firstborn who is resurrected because there were people resurrected in the Old Testament. All right? And he resurrected some people in the New Testament. But what, what is he speaking of? Well, I want you to see that he was the first that came out of the grave and is alive forevermore. Amen? In fact, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, the Bible says, I, here's Jesus, Jesus' words, red letter edition. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Now, he raised Lazarus from the dead, all right? But Lazarus died later on. But here is Jesus. He's the firstborn, the firstfruits of the resurrection. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death, all right? So he's the first one who defeated death and hallelujah because he did 
we can join in the resurrection parade. Amen. And that brings me, and here we are, we made it. The last point, last point, and that is Jesus is first in relationship to everything, period, end of discussion, end of sentence, end of debate. Notice that in all things, he may have the preeminence. And here's another translation of that I haven't shared with you. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And that's why I called the message that. Jesus first in everything. Now, think about this. That's what he wants. Are we giving that to him? Are we giving him first place? You know, it doesn't matter if we do or we don't. The fact is that he, he is first. That's what he wants. But are we giving him what he wants? All right. Think about it. First place in our life. First place at school. First place on the job. First place in the church. First day of the week. A lot of people won't give him the first day of the week. That's Sunday. A lot of people won't give him the first fruits of their increase. All right. That's of the tithe and of the offering. For, because why? They won't give him first place in their hearts. All right? But he deserves it all because as we've seen and as Paul has extolled and told us so brilliantly that he is first place in the universe of which we are. So here's the challenge. Here is the challenge of the Christian life, my friends. To keep Jesus first. Always. Always. All right? Because life is Jesus, and Jesus is life, and he deserves it because he is first. Will you stand? As we reflect on Colossians 1, 15, 18, we see that Jesus is indeed first in everything. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, and the head of the church. He is the one who sustains all things and has preeminence in all things. It is essential for us as believers to have a Christ-centered focus in our lives and to remember that Jesus should be first in everything we do. Let us be encouraged to put Jesus first in our relationship with the Father, in His creation, and in the unseen world. Let us also strive to honor Him by living a life that reflects His character and by putting Him first in our priorities. As we continue to grow in our faith, let us remember that we are joint heirs with Christ and that He is the firstborn from the dead. We can trust in Him for our eternal life and we can have hope in the promise of the resurrection. Let us pray that God will help us to live a Christ-centered life and that we will continue to put Jesus first in everything we do. May His name be exalted in our lives and may He receive all the glory and honor.